both to uh, have the honor to introduce a good friend and a very good and for Norway very important person. Elder Misha, he's a doctor, and he's, he's both a medical doctor and a doctor doctor. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the very interesting thing about Audun uh, is that his, his broad approach to medicine is very special. It's not that many doctors uh, around the world who are working so much into so such a broad field. From working with the fishermen in Lofoten to surgery and to being the master of, a, a, what do you say, the head doctor of a hospital and doing a lot of research. He has got uh, many prizes in Norway, he has got uh, especially prizes for bridging alternative medicine and ordinary medicine and uh, he's also uh, have awards for working with music and uh, he has a, a famous book in Norway this is uh, musical medicine and uh, that is a good as he said once I have been joining uh, he has a training also for for therapists in holistic medicine and he once said that uh, music is a very good way of talking to doctors because they can listen to, to uh, medical themes around, connected to music. But he's also been doing, for instance, flower remedy medicine and uh, a lot of energy medicine. So I'm really glad that he's here now. He's, he's been focusing and his doctor work was about uh, music uh, according to uh, dementia and Parkinson. He has one of the doctors that really focused on these two illnesses and finding, trying to find ways to treat them. So now, Eden, I will give you the word. Thanks a lot. Uh, it's a great honor to be here. And, uh, Proud and happy that this eminent uh, congress is taking place in Oslo. And uh, I've always been interested from my youth on about this interface between um, light, color, sound, music, voice. And uh, I looked into, in my youth, Steiner's, uh, Rudolf Steiner and others who tried to make this bridge. I also studied uh, the Tomatis method um, and then we had at our, at our center were also Alfred Tomatis, the French Imlai's throat doctor, did a lot of work of bridging these frequencies between color and sound. And I wonder, I, uh, it said today uh, here on the post that 2018 uh, is an orange year. Orange is the color of 2018. So I was thinking about that. So. What is orange? Orange. What is the sound of orange? What is the song of orange? <laughs> One thing is to measure it. We can hear that. But what if we just try it? What is the orange tone and what is the orange song? Mm -hmm. Let's see. I can. I can start out. It's. Uh, we just. Uh, my research has been not. Uh, I'm not like so much the deductive trying to find if the hypertension pill has an effect or not. I like the inductive or even the abductive where you start with things that don't fit in and you, you try and fail and you just go into the, the chaotic experience of the, what they call life and see what it is. We can see the orange, um, orange sound. <laughs> Song, the orange song, it won't think long. The orange song, the orange dance, the orange dance, the orange dance is here today. Do, 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 do. Yeah, so this is uh, <laughs> investigating. This is uh, serious research, you know, so, yeah. <laughs> so we try. You want to try to? Yeah, just for a moment, Let's try. Orange. Oh, no. <laughs> Tonight. Two glasses of wine and you and you're gonna be fine. <laughs> okay, okay. Gotta be patient with you. So I like to because my, my work has been with very much responsibility 
and the hardest uh, sort of diseases in medicine. So this is sort of my my loophole, so that I, <laughs> so the little child can also be somewhere in it. Because I think as human beings, we need to have it all. And this has made such an impression on me to see to compare healthy elders that I've studied now in the last decade more and more uh, and work with them. Uh, one of my most successful books has been The Fountain of Youth, Ungdalskjelden, as published a little over a year ago. And I'm, I'm go going around the country speaking to healthy seniors, and this is very meaningful. If they can keep well, uh, we, we will uh, really solve the riddle that dementia poses, as I will speak on the health services. And I see that the people who keep well into elderly states, they, they keep alive. They keep this uh, um, active mind. And if you knew um, the neuroprotection you get just from coming to this conference, you would really come to this conference. <laughs> the protection against dementia is formidable. And if you had come and danced with me now, it would have been even so much fun. <laughs> but uh, that's your responsibility. <laughs> but um, dementia, uh, I, I went into it because I saw that it was growing as a worldwide challenge. There's a myth, you know, that dementia is this uh, Western society challenge. That's a myth that is not correct because the real challenge within dementia is the low and middle income countries. There are countries in Africa and Asia where there's now an eightfold increase of dementia and they have no way of meeting it. It's a chaotic situation. My hope with the methods I've been working with and, uh, and hope to enter into a partnership with some of you here is to develop methods in our relatively wealthy, small and ordered country uh, where we can uh, devote resources to find the methods that can meet these future challenges. Because our uh, foremost epidemiological researcher in Norway is not particularly interested in dementia, but he says how we handle the dementia wave now will uh, determine uh, how we as a society will be able to survive uh, around 2040. That's his figures actually. So this, uh, so this has led me more and more into this area. And we have, in medicine, you know, we have this, um, this uh, tablets of stone where it's written that what really works after 1943, penicillin, it's drugs and surgery. You can have light. Oh, yeah, it's nice with nice lights. And colors. Oh, oh and some color clothes. That's nice. But what works? That's the rugs and surgery. So, but here, 25 years, the amyloid hypothesis. You know uh, amyloid? It's a gelatin-like substance that starts impinging on the brain. And this has been 25 years of uh, research and uh, billions and billions uh, of kroner, even euro, uh, have been devoted into this area. And finally, in 2016, they were nearing uh, uh, the end result, promising results, two of the largest pharmaceutical companies. And at the end of 2016, it failed. And they got even worse. You know why? Because the amyloid, it, uh, it starts um, after uh, dementia changes start in the brain. So now it may be that the amyloid actually is a substance that the brain secretes to protect itself against dementia. So it may be the same uh, cholesterol logic that um, cholesterol is an anti-inflammatory substance and we find cholesterol uh, when where there's heart disease and then people say the logic is that what do you see every time there's a fire firemen you got to destroy the firemen <laughs> yeah. so uh, this is to say that um, we got to be uh, we got to be sober I, I use uh, drugs as a doctor, I use even this uh, Donepecil uh, Aricept, but as you see, uh, in uh, the best journal, New England Journal of Medicine, there was a large study on agitation, where it went no better than placebo. And actually, still people are talking and talking in 2018 about the 
the miracle drug for dementia. We got to be sober because the two main cognitive system in the brain, systems in the brain, uh, have already drugs available. Ariset, as I said, is the acetylcholine system where uh, Ariset acts to counteract uh, the breakdown of acetylcholine. And the NMDA system, do you know that? Some do. The NMDA system is the other learning system. It's not a pure cognitive system. It's a learning by feeling. It's like a, a child, uh, it doesn't have a category, it knows. But then it gathers gnosis. Tactically, and people say gnosis, and gradually you learn. You know, uh, you feel, you get the sensory impressions, that's the NMDA system. That's the problem with chronic pain, because chronic pain takes the NMDA system, the learning system, to itself. And that's why people are not... People say they become better persons from cancer, many, but they don't say they become better persons from chronic pain. Because the learning system is taken by the chronic pain. But this is a bit a very good drug for the NMDA system, but still... It's there in nursing homes, it makes not a huge difference because we are holistic beings and the breakdown in dementia is not just some, um, some uh, synapses in the brain, it's the whole person. The recent, I've, I've uh, had my greatest professional success perhaps with working with dementia is that I said, well I can't cure dementia, but I can do something about the vicious cycle of the generation. Because when you start uh, gradually, you start giving up, uh, what is the gate going to be like? People said when I started 20 years ago in nursing homes, they said, when you're 80, you're going to go like this. Re remember that, Anadi. Enjoy life until you're 80, then you're going to walk <laughs> like this. <laughs> uh, but, but that's not true at all, because this is what, uh, what happens, is the gradual, vicious cycle. Uh, you start hearing um, less and then you withdraw from conversations, you sit there, uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. uh, and uh, you start seeing less, and you start walking less, and, and the whole system goes to shut down. So actually, dementia, uh, the destruction of the cognitive systems is just one part of it. For instance, uh, do you know Snowden's nun study? It's been ongoing for over 30 years now. 700 nuns in uh, monasteries in the U.S. And they fare remarkably. One thing is that they are the, the single occupation with the longest lifespan. What does that say about sex and family and parenthood? <laughs> no, I don't think it says anything about that. I think it is that they continue being active. They have made a life choice with values and activities, and even though they get old, even though we have a stroke, they carry on, they carry on. You understand? Yeah. That this shutdown of the system is what we need to do something about. And there is where sound and light uh, have such promise, because they can go into, um, into these systems and counteract uh, the, uh, the degenerative process, which is in all of the body. In my PhD, I had in-depth examination of over 600 residents in 14 nursing homes. And it made such an impression on me because I could see there that what happens is that you have, um, any of you has had the dubious pleasure of having uh, three, four healthy children around. It's like... <laughs> <laughs> and... Oh, <laughs> uh, and um, and they just keep on hour after hour. There was this Olympic uh, uh, top athlete who uh, wanted in a study where they they couldn't see the movements of small children, and they wanted him to mirror so they could see it and film it better. Uh, and 22 minutes, and the Olympic uh, fighter collapsed, <laughs> and the child kept on playing. Amazing! All the dopamine, all the hormones. But then we go for gradual shutdown through the years. And this is a, it's a total. I examined them. I'm also trained in body and energy therapies, so I could examine all these points. This injury here, that was not f fully, uh, fully, fully recovered. This uh, loss here, not 
emotionally not recovered. This operation here, not fully recovered, you see? One step at a time, gradual shutdown. And uh, I saw, um, I've also had the same number of in-depth examinations in Parkinson. And I saw that young people, we are now getting in Norway many, uh, getting the diagnosis in their 30s. Uh, and uh, in all the, the persons I examined, the hip joint and the psoas were completely locked. This posture in Parkinson, it's not Parkinson. It's the psoas, the iliopsoas that goes into contraction. Isn't it logical? But we always said, oh, that's when you get Parkinson and you become like that. Sorry, that's bullshit. It's, uh, it's the vicious cycle. That's the problem. And we need to do something about it. But the challenge, if you look from the research area, is that um, the psychosocial research has often had a lack of syst systematic approaches, everyone doing a bit on their own area, and we need to bring the field together. That's why I'm here. We need um, to look in single-factor research, like in light investigation or light therapy. We need to look at how it can be investigated, integrated into other therapeutic modalities. In another slide I'll show you um, my, my initial PhD work. There was an, a colleague of mine who worked at the same institute and he, um, he did um, his PhD on bright light therapy in nursing homes. A Norwegian PhD, have you heard about it? No, no one has. He did his PhD but he uh, he, he put the labs there and he found that that could be good. It was published in international journals. But I came to one of these nursing homes that had a project later. No one remembered that there had been lights there because there was taking no care of integrating it. You see, it has to be integrated. If, and people, they, this is not part of the mindset of people who work in dementia. That we use bright light, huh? Drugs. And being good persons, yes. So just working uh, this mindset, changing the mindset, even with myself, um, uh, it took so many years in my projects before uh, this hardwiring, every time I see a patient with pain, that this huge um, poster from, from, my, uh, from the very depth uh, of me with the uh, Paralgin Forte, it's a painkiller. <laughs> comes up. It took me several years because that was a way and I could look at freely uh, outside of my conditioning. And also so much of the researches uh, on uh, drugs for instance, they are done in constructive situations and uh, we need to look at the real life situations. You get millions for funding for doing a study and then after the study you're back to the old situation with fewer, not the extra people in, you, you have just a few old tired people uh, tending to the old tired people and, and we need to look at the real life situation and investigate what works when they're, they're, we're understaffed, when we're underpaid, uh, when things are not optimal. You, see, you understand me? Mm -hmm. and, and what we can do out from there. And we also need the long term follow ups. Uh, it's been very interesting for me now to do, uh, for instance, I have now um, done um, research on exercise with Parkinson and we are now, this summer, seven years uh, in study. And this is very rare in elderly care, that we get seven years of follow-up. And then we do get some very interesting findings. But uh, most studies have in maximum three months, often just short term. And then it's... <laughs> If I hit you on the hammer with the head, uh, uh, the head with the hammer, then it will have effect, right? But so what? What what works long term to change? I have investigated before this lecture now what is done. Uh, uh, I don't know since you don't have other lectures on light uh, work in dementia, or, um, light therapy in dementia. I would like to just look at. Uh, sleep disorders, one of the main symptoms that light therapy has been used for. And it's a chicken and the egg situation, because um, sleep disorders, that's uh, coming up as one of the main factors uh, predisposing to dementia. 
So if you lie now tonight and you cannot sleep, then thank you. I'm going to get to make sure. No, it's not, it's not that uh, bad. But you do need to get your deltas. You do need to get deep sleep. Uh, what we've seen with, um, uh, with uh, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, that we have to do something about. Uh, the deep relaxation, because people are sleeping like 10 hours. Uh, one of my patients sleeps 16 hours a day, and she's always tired when she's awake because it doesn't get down into the delta area of the EEG. You understand me? And, uh, and therefore, um, when people get dementia, uh, there is a predilection to sleep disorders. Um, is this too heavy for you now just after lunch, or can I do something? Yeah. It's actually a nucleus um, in the brain, which we have here, that is linked directly to sleep. And it's also linked to the eye, to our eyesight. And this um, is, we see in images of dementia, that this nucleus, which is just above uh, the pituitary hypophysin and uh, linked to the optic nerve. And this um, governs some of the light-dark cycle in us and also the sleep-wake cycle. And here we come to sun downing. Have you heard about that? Yeah. It's... Um, one of the um, uh, really challenging symptoms in uh, dementia that I've had a lot to deal with. Because in the evenings, when we are short of staff, that's when people get going. We have some of the same sundowning in people with eating disorders as well. They come in the morning, salads and water and jogging and everything is fine. And then 6 o'clock sharp p.m., zombie to the freezer. Ice cream, ice cream, ice cream. Same in sundowning in dementia. People are, hello everybody, nice to see you. Every day, today is perfect day, the best day of your life. And then six o'clock. <laughs> Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. And it's not that the person suddenly turns bad. It's, um, it's that uh, the whole light-dark cycle is confused. And the whole orientation of the brain um, uh, with the sensory input uh, into the body becomes uh, damaged and pe people get confused like that. You lose orientation. And uh, I've been working a lot with music um, in to counteract sundowning. If we have time, I will show you some slides. Uh, we can also look at the research. Uh, you can have these if uh, some of you are interested. Uh, these are some of the um, uh, good studies who sh congruently show that uh, uh, bright full spectrum light in 10,000 uh, lux. This can reset the circ circadian rhythm. And the most important thing is that this can also have a long term effect. And a great thing that's happened is that they are just now starting in eight nursing homes in Bergen. Uh, research on light. They are putting up uh, bright light areas and applying light to um, 70 to 100 patients. They're not quite sure, but up to 100 patients. They're just at the starting point. Did, did you know about this? And this, but is there a backside? The backside is, as I said, uh, here's the study I talked about, uh, no follow-up, then it's forgotten, no long-term implementation, but there's also no integration with other therapies. I have been working with music in Bergen for, uh, uh, for, uh, for 10, 15 years uh, or more, and uh, I, I collaborate closely with the dementia unit in Bergen, who has set up this light study. They have not talked to me about it, and they have not talked to the light people, the light workers, isn't that what you call them, uh, who have the light study about what we are doing with music. Do you see my point? We are not integrating. We are just everyone doing their stuff on their own. And uh, this is what we need to do something about. 
And uh, to see how we can integrate long term, I wanted to show you how we can use music based caregiving, uh, how we can use song and music in dementia care. This has been developed from 2000 and onward. I had my PhD in 2012 and I've developed a systematic education for healthcare workers who I don't sing, I cannot sing. If you want me to sing, I say that I'll never. I'm never, never going to sing in my life. And that's interesting because when I come up in and teach those people, I come in and before I'm coming, they're sitting there. Oh, have you seen Anne lately? Oh, yes, I met her at the swimming pool. You know what she did to my home. I can't sing. <laughs> Everyone who can speak can sing. Neurophysiological, maybe not like Pavarotti or whatever, but they can sing. So, uh, but we do have in this method. You can have Spotify or or whatever uh, the passive uh, approaches as well. Uh, so, um, so we have uh, we have actually taught them to use music in a systematic way, and that has been so successful that the Norwegian Health Directory has made now a national implementation project that where I, I don't know any other country who has this, that the state is leading the implementation of a non-pharmaceutical therapy in one of the great spe big specialties. Isn't that great? So it's a five-year implementation. And here comes the point that I'm... Um, yeah, I can't break it. Uh, it's like Christmas Eve. I, I was going to break it at the end of my lecture, but I cannot uh, wait. <laughs> Sorry. I just... Uh, um, I, uh, just um, yesterday, um, or oh, and the day before, I've been being in phone calls from, um, from NTNU, the main, uh, one of the main research institutions and a famous university in Norway, uh, who that... Um, combines um, te technology with uh, medicine and uh, they are doing a large pain study in dementia because that's one of the big underreported symptoms in dementia and they were looking for an intervention and uh, they have decided to use music-based caregiving as the intervention it's a large study with eight nursing homes and 200 included patients um, all over the country, and I was seeing now if I can sneak in light as one of the elements in music-based caregiving. And I'll tell you why light uh, is so is so interesting. Um, are you still fresh? Can I say something more? Uh, uh, Resource-based medicine is uh, my thesis. Is that we our medicine has been very successful in the um, one diagnosis, one treatment, based on pathology. We need to focus now on resources, being equally sharp on finding how we uncover the healthy human being, also in the midst of disease. It's like one old lady said to me, uh, well, of course, I've had my, my cancer and I don't hear, and I uh, just had an operation, but I'm healthy. <laughs> it's, so it's not just depending on lack of disease. It's uh, many other areas that we need to uncover. So what I've done is going into nursing homes. Have you seen the people sitting there? Uh, access to coping resources. How do we do it? I'll, uh, I'll throw you into it. This is from one of my students at the T this uh, compact uh, three-day uh, three teaching. Uh, and here's um, an old lady who's parked in nursing home. She's degenerating slowly. She's just sitting in her chair. Have you seen them? You want to come in the activity? No. How is it going on? Uh, and this, uh, this is a challenge because we know this is a degenerative spiral. And we try to find music for her. Here we are. He tries to 
play music to wake her and engage her. I know that, she says. This is accordion music, of course. It doesn't get her off her feet. Are you impressed? And then you have some dancers coming up uh, and she sits there passively well. They enjoy themselves but she sits there passively having no reaction. Are you impressed? No, this, this is a sign that the nervous system is not engaged. It's a repetitive movement. So then we start to the same side. It's the same as what we begin to the So we have two so small nicks in the side. One and two. Back to the left. Three and four. One and two. Three and four. One and two. Three and four. Here is Polka. Let's try it. Her feet are partially paralyzed. Sustains the response. You see, it's not just a momentary response. Uh, she keeps it on, and she also opens up into engagement, to relationship. Uh, I think that. One of the areas we could bring in, which I've covered in my uh, up to now last book uh, issue this year, uh, Pust Breathing, uh, where I've investigated um, the whole field of coherence, where in breath um, we can really breathe together. You know what uh, the word for breathing together is? Conspiracy. <laughs> conspiracy, yeah. People are talking about conspiracy theories. I want uh, conspiracy practice. <laughs> so, um, and, and this is the engagement. You get the sensory engagement. How does this, this relate to the excellent presentation before lunch? It relates in what I've investigated, because um, in the Norwegian medical research milieus, the openness for chakras is uh, very small, to put it mildly. Uh, so, <laughs> that was a joke. <laughs> uh, so, I have, um, uh, I have looked at uh, it from the area of the neurological precision. I've taken training in uh, neurologic music therapy, which has been a very 
enriching way of building bridges, even though it's very strictly evidence-based. It has to do with precision. Here you see the difference between not hitting the note and then hitting precisely. So what is in music-based caregiving is finding even simple, almost banal songs, but you hit precisely um, the, the song that has the codes of recognition, of meaning, maps of meaning, the codes of meaning, you understand me? And even, uh, I've investigated, and now we're in uh, territory from the last lecture, uh, which I'll show you shortly, that the rhythm has to be precise. Uh, if you have the precise rhythm, you will walk in a different, uh, in a different way. It's like even with me, if I have a metronome with, with this rhythm a bit too fast, I go more like this, and too slow, I go more like this, get the right rhythm. And this is a replicable. I've, I've done a study of this with healthy people, young people, old people, and people with Parkinson and dementia. And, and you need to find this precise uh, way of targeting the other. I, I don't think it's any different with uh, being um, a therapist like in um, any other psych, uh, psychological therapies, speaking with the other person, finding the right note. You, you get me? You are a therapist, you see, finding the right word at the right time. It's timing. It's like music, and that's why I like music so much. Because, and it's been so, I learned so much from working in dementia with this. And if we, if we look further into this area, I will just shortly show you a couple of more videos uh, on this precision. Because um, if you look at uh, music-based caregiving, it has a lot, uh, several elements. And uh, the therapeutic philosophy is uh, seeing the person, because you can go into all the right movements, the right frequencies. But if we don't respect the other person, if we don't listen, if we just take our own, now we're going to find, find the right frequencies. We're going to heal you. Here, here you are. <laughs> Here's the healing call. Here's the healing color, here's the healing sound. Uh, we have to, to see that uh, our duty is the, is the radical listening into the moment. We are taught to be competent doctors, but I tell you, my main mistakes have always been when I've been to follow myself. I thought I've known. Ta -ta -ta -ta, coming in, and I don't know the whole picture. I, I'm a great believer in confusion, uncertainty. The, uh, the main difference with, between me and uh, some other persons is that I've learned to love it. I embrace it in ig ignorance. And uh, because then new knowledge can come in. We need to listen above all. And environment. This is the whole superstition in the one factor medicine that uh, has functioned so well for me in uh, surgery, in in acute cardiac care, in uh, regular all acute medicine. People uh, who have uh, broken an arm or, uh, or, cut, uh, or cut themselves here, they uh, like if I'm a nice human being, but they're not interested in holism, they're interested in having it fixed. You see me? But in nursing homes, in the long-term area that we are entering into in this uh, aging population, you know what the uh, worldwide um, average lifespan was uh, when we started in the 1900s, from the figures I've seen? It was in, uh, it was 32.5. They said, yeah. But when we entered the 21st century, it was in the 60s. Almost a doubling. You see, it's dramatic. In Norway, men live 12 years longer in my lifetime. In other, like in Costa Rica, it's much more dramatic than that, you see. And there, therefore, uh, our disease spectrum will become much more multifactorial. It will become much more learning to cope long term. And there, we need to look at the environment. What, what are the sounds in a nursing home? People are exposed. And um, my students, they are shocked when they go back to the nursing home and see all this. Um, this use of sound and light. Silence, silence, silence. Ah! 
Silence, silence. Ah! You can see how does it work on it. Anavi, can I have you? Can I borrow you for a moment? I certainly can. If, uh, if you say you're yes, I don't want to intrude on you, but you are a grown man, uh, and you're a senior man, can you wield an axe? No. No, can, can you do that? Have you done that? Yes, sure. Yeah, sure. Yes. Can you do it? Yes. Yeah, there you see. I, I, I saw it on you that you are, you're senior. And we see here now, you're strong, I cannot budge you. Ah! <laughs> you have no chance. No one has a chance uh, for this one. Hold all you can. Anadi, anadi. No, no one. So if you if you get some bully coming towards you, big bully, and he thanks, uh, you can sit down. I might need you again. Thanks a lot. If some big bully comes towards you and say, "Give me all your cash," you say, "Ah!" and run. <laughs> <laughs> but this people are exposed to day after day after day in the nursing home. You see, talk about healing. Like, and, and what about the lights? Dark and these fluorescent lights, and many of them in uh, in these uh, tubes that are half uh, half uh, gone. You know, I've sat I've sat in these uh, rooms with people agitated with dementia. And then on comes the radio. Uh, I won't terrorize you more with sound, but just a little bit more. <laughs> uh, they, they put on the radio when they do the morning. I sit there observing, taking notes, video filming, and uh, yet now, and now we're on the radio. Oh, hey everybody! Now the summer's over. We're gonna interview uh, Ellie from uh, Longus. Uh, how's it going? Ah, no, no, no. And I was ready. I'm a non-violent person, but I was ready to smash that room after five minutes of that wait. And then, and then this light in top, you know, bling, bling. <sighs> and they are exposed to this day around, year round. You understand me? And and we we thought we have this superstition on the one drug, and sorry to say, it doesn't work. We have to look at this, uh, the environment, the sensory stimulation, because the two big factors for health. When we look at the aging population, I'll tell you the two main factors, and they are not in what you've been taught, I think. The one is attention. Attention is going to be the, uh, uh, the World War III will be about water, uh, clean water, but uh, what uh, the fight in society will be about uh, attention. That's coming already. Everyone wants to have our attention. And people have a strong, uh, attention, who can open and close at will, have a strong immune system for their attention. I'm not asking you to have your attention on me. I can humbly uh, ask to be worthy of it by delivering something that interests you. But you have the full right to close off, or sleep, or, or go away, because I, I see that over time, people who don't function in society are people who have weakened attention. I see in the, old, the elderly, who stay healthy, they may have many small diseases, but their attention is strong. They come. My, uh, my mentor, uh, he's 92 years old, now always on a meeting, he says, Odin, what have you learned uh, from last? I, I don't want to miss a moment. We are some hours together. He doesn't budge in his attention for a single second. He's just, you see, he has this complete attention. In dementia, uh, you cannot. So I think in the future, treatment for dementia and uh, children and youth uh, with uh, agitation, ADHD and uh, attention deficit will be more similar. And it's already happening. You know what's happened? Um, a year ago we uh, were asked to do a pilot with the same methods for uh, um, children and youth with uh, uh, school problems in Stavanger. And this was such a success that we are now progressing to a larger project. Isn't that great? I think it's uh, something. We need to look at uh, the sensory simulation. Because the sensory simulation, st good studies have shown that it's uh, increased by 10 in my lifetime. Does that sound much? Or do you recognize yourself in it? Uh, the radical change with the, with the internet, which should make everything so easy for us. 
but it's become a, a sensory stimulant for, the, for, stimulant for the eye. We need to rest the eye, but we also need to expose the eye to correct stimulation. And I think this is where the expertise that you are building up here is so important on the societal level. Because we, in Norway, we see so many youths who collapse now. Every, after every lecture I have, there are, are desperate parents and grandparents coming up, especially with boys, 14, 17, whatever. They just lie in bed. They collapsed. And no one finds anything. Uh, it's not uh, on uh, blood samples, x-rays, psychiatric examinations. People from good homes, not traumatized. They are just overstimulated. So sensory stimulation is so important. And what we need to bring in with the right rhythm from the musical area is uh, the three inner senses. Do you know the three inner senses? Uh, you have, as you know, the, the sense of touch. It's the innermost of the... You have a sight, uh, sight sound. Uh, um, and, then, um, uh, and then smell and taste, and you have touch. But you have also underneath the touch is out here. In here is the, the vibrational sense. <coughs> and this vibrational sense uh, gives access to the inner vibrations. And here we have the interface to, inner, to, to energy medicine. And it surprises me that the field of energy medicine has not gone more into the investigation of the three deeper senses, because there you have the access also into regular research. I hadn't thought about it before I started investigating dementia, where you see so much, uh, they, are, they have not been touched for five years, they're just sitting there. No activation of the sense. And if you start walking like this, the vibratory sense under your, your feet. Uh, the Venerable Mr. Oshman is one of my uh, guiding lights. He has spoken about he, uh, being barefoot. Strange thought, isn't it? No, it's not strange, because you're talking about the ions and the grass and all this thing. I'm talking also about the vibratory sense. If you go like this, it's not enough to walk on the grass, sorry to say, barefoot, if you go like this. But here, this is the vibratory. See, here you have the vibrational sense. And also the, the second one is the proprioceptive. This is the, the joint sense. Uh, and you see how uh, the vicious cycle, you, you, you gain, you lose access to the inner being. And you can have, uh, sorry to say, you can lots of nice lights and right colors and all this, but if you keep go sitting in a chair most of the day and when you walk, you walk like this you're going to have a problem with the long-term effect. <laughs> we need, uh, I hope I don't insult you by saying this, we need to look holistically into this. Uh, because the, the whole, if you get up for, for a moment, can you? I've been talking for a long time. And you just try now to, uh, to just uh, move your limbs in the way they want to do. And you just walk like you want to do. And then we have the, uh, the deepest one, it's the balance uh, sense, and uh, this is uh, when you really get into the rhythm here, this is, this is a golden exercise. Many of the Parkinson sufferers who do well, they do this every day, and also the rotation. And then you, and when you get into the rhythm, this affects it. You, yeah, that's why I saw first when I started with Parkinson 15, 20 years ago. I saw that many of them couldn't walk, but they could dance for hours longer than me. They just walk, dance, 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 dance. <laughs> A 
So these are the 3D processes. So uh, if we can devise such a holistic method that includes communication skills, not just coming in because it helps little. What happens, my dear friends, again to this excellent uh, presentation? Uh, you get uh, your stuff in to a nursing home which I dream about, and then you've exposed the person to this beautiful harp music that the young body has, has made with overtone singing and all this, and you sit there. And then the person is in a nursing home, and there comes a stressed, a uh, stressed healthcare worker. Now we're gonna do your, uh, gonna wash your on your hair. So, so what happens? We need to develop communication skills. Listen. When do we transgress boundaries? How do we respect the other space? All these skills we need to develop, so that all these excellent methods can be placed in the right context. Uh, and um, the methods that we use, the musical methods, uh, I can show you here shortly. Uh, I don't have so much, um, I see time is starting to, to run out, but uh, we got a, lot, a good bit of publicity also in looking at the variables that we've investigated, like also vitality, joy, peace and transcendence. And we've seen that um, in depression, we have uh, shown significant uh, results on depression uh, with music and also on the, not only on the patients, but the healthcare workers. Uh, sick leave in one three-year project went down from 20%, which is a European top, uh, to, to 5%. This was in 2000, uh, from uh, early 2001-2005. And then the leadership in Chickens Bimishon, an organization um, that has nursing homes, among others, uh, had a very strange idea. They said, this works, we continue with it. <laughs> Instead of saying that, been here, done that. <laughs> That's the normal stuff, you know. And you know what? The sick leave in these three rundown institutions in the worst part of Oslo have been down on around 5% for 12 years or more or, or, uh, now. Isn't that something? And uh, if we have several here, here I have another nursing home too, where they have, were up in 30% Norwegian record, and they're stably down now. They, they are teaching others how to do dementia care because they've learned a systematic way of approaching. Uh, extra meditation goes, uh, medication goes down, and we have this coherence in action. We bring children in singing for the elderly. And that's a, a no-brainer, you know. They sit there and think, finally, I'm going to be left in peace, and then they come, <laughs> and then they come. <laughs> they can just forget the peace, you know. <laughs> and you see, the, the small children, four years old, they just bring the old, the old people out of a wheelchair, you know. <laughs> I have some videos that are really sweet, but I don't know if I'm allowed to show them here, so. And also wheelchair dance. We, we've gotten some people out of this disability just by getting the right dancing notes. Um, uh, the first time I saw it, it was a lady. Uh, some people have a neurological disability. They have um, uh, paresis, par paralysis, but some people have just been, got used to sitting. And first time I saw it was, you know, Lily Marlene. And there was this lady in a wheelchair. Out of the wheelchair. And this, this is, of course, an anecdote. But uh, it, the anecdotes are not to be discarded because they show an, a, a direction. They so, show so, somewhere you can go. But it's about the rhythm. The metronome assisted movement here, you see in rehabilitation uh, after an injury. Um, where you're trying to learn to use the right movement. You're trying like that, you're trying like that, and you go all over the place. But it, to find the right um, angle, you can use the metronome, finding the right uh, rhythm. And music can um, 
coordinate perception, memory, attention, motor control. Uh, and we see that if you uh, go, I'll go a bit fast here, if you get the right uh, rhythmic auditory st stimulation, you can improve gait and you, and you open the gates of, of senses, actually. And I will show you in practice how this rhythmic auditory stimulation works here now from videos. Um, I feel this, uh, I have many uh, videos of, of it, but here you can see an, a person with, uh, with uh, Parkinson. He has had a small stroke. He has uh, troubles with uh, uh, getting his left arm into it. He goes faster, but then he stops. That's called freezing. Have you seen that? The freezing. And then he goes on. And he's afraid of falling because he's lost the cross crawl, the diagonal. And so I put on the metronome. And here is the, is the main point, that here is where the last lecture and mine come together. Because it's finding the precise frequency. And I look then at uh, finding uh, where uh, can I get his maximum potential in, by finding the exact frequency. And um, I put on the metronome a bit slow. Why? To not to to engage the sympathetic uh, sympathetic area. Stress, in other words. We, so we start slow. Here we have the metronome. Does he taste the metronome? He does. He even does carry over when I stop the metronome, so we can now continue and increase the frequency. Gradually, a gradual small increment, so his body can get used to it and gradually uh, get up in frequency. And look here now, look what happens. Did you see what happens in the last picture, in the last second or so? Yeah. He went, what's that called? Cross, Cross crawl. Yeah. He had gone like this, you know, and this is not very effective. Try, try walking like that yourself. But this is effective. He goes into it, and what happens when he gets into the cross crawl? He Johnny Cash is back. <laughs> <laughs> so, th th this is something. Um, so, we really ease into this area of finding the, the precise rhythm. And it happens, the reason why I show this one is that you see so clearly what happens in the exact second when he hits the, the, right, uh, the, the right note and the right frequency. So here we're into frequency medicine, actually. Uh, by the back door, so to speak. And now he's, this is a bad uh, video, uh, video quality, uh, but uh, just see how it is. Did you see this, this, this man who started, uh, started in this here? And his wife is uh, saying in the background, Oh no, oh wow. If you could walk like that, then it would... Oh, <laughs> what does she see? She's been worried about this man that she's losing gradually to Parkinson and dementia, and suddenly she sees that. Did you see this man? This, uh, this very handsome young man that she felt helplessly in love with 42 years ago. Isn't that something? Five minutes and a metronome. And it's the same thought as with frequency medicine, light and sound if you can find the precise frequency. But as the Venerable Mr. Oshman so rightly states in his gathering of research, it's not just a matter of, of finding one frequency. Often you have to find this spectrum of frequency. Like healers, effective healers, they have access to many frequencies. So we have to experiment. 
to find both the, the sharp frequency but also the context. And everybody is different. That is why I, why I don't, I do not have the one frequency for everyone every time, not even the one frequency for the one person because they say very. The only thing that's an absolute is here and now. For me, for you, there is one frequency in this very moment. That is the idea. That is the only absolute. But which frequency it is, that we have to test. So uh, I can only show you here that if, you, if you're a bit too cocky, like I was, uh, I, I take one of my other patients a bit too fast. She's had a stroke, she falls, and she's been hospitalized two times in the 14 days before this was taken. And here she is, and she does like normally, you see, she, she, um, she uh, the stroke uh, makes her, when she starts, she starts walking, she goes over here, and she falls. And she's afraid of walking, she's in a vicious cycle. I include this because it shows how we can break a vicious cycle. Because then I take down, now listen, I take uh, the metronome one, down one beat a minute. From I think 109 to 108 as far as I remember. Yeah, so I you walk steady? Yes. And the clinical consequence is that she, uh, she then uses the metronome and can dare to walk inside and then outside. She lives for two more years and has a high quality of life being, uh, being, uh, being self-contained, living at home. That is what we manage. That we, instead of this vicious cycle, uh, the bad news is that the patients in my population, the years go by and sooner or later they die, the old ones. But the good news is that they keep here, not here. You understand me? They they can they can live the uh, the digni dignified life, and uh, this is in uh, just doesn't need to be old people. Here's uh, a patient in her forties and a patient in his fifties to show real life situations. Here is the metronome. Uh, the freezing uh, makes Parkinson uh, patients fear going over intersections because the green light stop, starts flickering and they panic, they freeze, so they don't dare. So here she is trying to traverse the street at, uh, near our center in Chi, south of Oslo. And now I, she learns to Hvis vi skal stoppe opp under gangen, for eksempel over et kaffekryss, så kan vi være noe som nærmere til det for Parkinson-pasienter. Så kan du telle deg selv i gangen. Let's see now. Try to hold it. Telle deg selv. Kan du telle deg selv? This is in Norwegian. We will, we will see the other one here first, I'll explain. And here's another Parkinson patient who is starting getting uh, balance problems and he's uh, worked with rhythm on a training ball. He has had Parkinson for 18 years and he's starting to fall. And we did intensive training with rhythm and finding the precise rhythm. He tries to get up, he has a hard time, but then he introduces rhythm. But then, he, if he starts taking a rhythm to the ball, see what happens. Then he can stay on the ball.
So here, here he is. That's how. That's the value of rhythm because you coordinate, coordinate all the forces. This happens primarily. The rhythm hits the alarm system in the in the brainstem, and this goes to the brain. It goes out to the body. It's the soldier principle. The soldier is tired. He can't do any more, and they just da 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 da. da. I need food. Da 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 da. da. I want to sleep. Da 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 da. da. Uh, and I can't do any more. Da 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 da. da. <laughs> it just overrides, you see, and um, and that's uh, this led to the hymn. Uh, he had ten years of good balance before he finally succumbed to uh, to needing uh, uh, to needing care in an elder institution. Are those ten years worth fighting for? Ask his wife. I met her recently. It's, uh, this is uh, the perspective for our aging population. Uh, we are... Uh, I just want to show you also um, a sum up from my projects um, before I come to a conclusion. A short video, the last video I show, which will be... Here you see the rhythm. Did you see there? Uh, this lady, she cannot walk. She only has to support herself like this. But when she look at her now, the one in the blue top. You see that? This awakens the programs in the brain. She's learned to dance. I can't do it. I try to do it, but I, I miss a bit. <laughs> Here's a lady who's been in nursing home for 12 years. Seven of them without language, completely pacifized, in a downward spiral. There we see what happens. The rhythm makes her take initiative and she support it so that she can come up again and uh, what happened a um, um, week after this video was taken we were singing together and uh, she got into the groove bro bro brille da 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 coherence the wave do 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 Da do 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 do. A ba ba do 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 do. Da do do ba do 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 do. And a few days later, I came down to the nursing home, and the nurse came with tears and said, "You know what's happened to her? She started talking after seven years. People didn't like it so much because then she had needs, so you got to know what to do. But this is what we can do because this." vicious cycle if we've given up on life and life is given up life will never give up on us luckily but we, we need to bring in these precise codes for coping coping medicine this is what i want sound and light and all to be put into into this real life and all the suffering uh, the new type of suffering that will come with the aging population and i think we are at the point where we can uh, promote dignity, like we see here now. If we, uh, I'll try to start it here again, we see the end of it. I think uh, I used that video because to me these three, three short sequences show so much about what it's all about. <laughs> this vicious cycle of uh, people starting walking like this, starting uh, losing the contact with their inner life. We're talking about inner life like some metaphysical dimension which it is of course, 
but it also has this very concrete physical dimension to it. Being in contact with ourselves. Proprioceptive means being in contact, sensing ourselves, being in contact with our proper self. And uh, also this, uh, this giving up for the resignation, the vicious cycles, which is, uh, which is becoming a new class division. It's not, it's not uh, the, uh, the classical Karl Marx, uh, Marx uh, division. It's the division between the active and the inactive. It's becoming clearer and clearer year by year in uh, all the countries where we have data. And we have a duty to look at the people, not saying, hey, you need to eat healthy, you need to exercise, come on. We need to go in where people are and listen and offer uh, these gifts of the music, song, dance, sound, light, color, which are some of these deeper elements that will always appeal to the human beings, because they are the most um, useful um, areas that the human has with no proven utility in one way because uh, because they speak to this interface of the physical and the subtle dimensions of the human being that's why why these areas always have appealed so much to me and it's about in the end it's not even about treatment uh, treating the symptoms are only a means uh, for me the end is that is this huge undertaking we have done, we have taken in our culture that every human being, maybe even every living being has a right to live and even has equal value. If it's subscribed to that, then to me, for me to see, we have a duty to look into how we can come as close as possible to providing every human being with this dignity and using these elements that we are investigating these days in a precise way tailored to the person and the groups. I've, I've shown a bit with dementia and Parkinson, how, how we can use it. And, and my dream is this field that can go beyond the confines that are found in some areas of evidence-based medicine, not in the areas where it's tailored. It was well tailored to uh, to acute cardiac wards, I, I worked, but with all um, all the complex ailments in the populations of now the fatigue, the stress, the tiredness, uh, we we need to look in new ways, and I feel that this synthesis of sound and light can provide many of the um, of the solutions for, for the future challenges that we are going into. And therefore, I honor very much your undertaking. I honor uh, the great work you do. Uh, uh, and uh, I have had some experiences with, um, with the sense of swear uh, on, on some patients. And to me, it seems like it's much the same that you, James, talked about with the healer. Um, the patients I tried it on have been stuck in a rut, they've been stuck in some uh, small patterns like that. And when they get these, they get these, all these shifting patterns, they get, oh, there's a new possibility, new option. Because life will uh, grab you by the balls just about every day, at least it does with me. <laughs> And, uh, and the, main, the main thing is that we need to develop resilience. We need to develop the ability to rise and rise again. And that's why I felt this sense of spirit so beautiful. I had at the office one day, the one bad news after the other came in, and I saw this color shy experiment. Oh yeah, there's another one. <laughs> there's another one. New chance, new opportunity. Um, because um, in, in Norway, we have, uh, to me, one sacred song that has come the last years, uh, uh, that uh, boy best the dog, that no matter our disabilities, uh, it, the refrain is like, Mang ska vi møte, og mang ska vi mestre, dagen i dag, den ska bli vår beste dag. That this day can be our very best day if we can get the tools for rising to the challenges. And um, it's for me to say that we're all in this together. And I dream about this new 
the professional field growing forward, being driven by professionals. I mentioned you, James, because you meant a lot to me and your ability to gather material. And there are many from my home country here who have made a similar contribution in their piece. And I honor uh, very much uh, the intention of what you're working with. And I hope to, in my way, to be a part of it in the years to come. Because uh, I am, I feel I'm at a starting point. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you for interested in uh, contact around the Marie and the other excellent professionals have my contact data. I've, I have not stopped writing books. I've written 22 now and I, I got I gotten into the group <laughs> and uh, I will continue. So I hope you have a great afternoon. I think we can take one or two questions. Uh, questions? Yes. Not too long. But no, no. Uh, I'm here. It's uh, to uh, if you are. Still. Yeah, you're looking good. You're looking good. Yeah. Hello. Oh. Uh, I'm Mari. I'm a lighting designer, architectural lighting designer, based in, here in Oslo. Uh, and I'm um, uh, besides the lighting, I'm also concerned with daylight, natural light. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you have, uh, uh, if you know of studies where they have experienced with. Um, daylight exposure for elderly care, for example, um, with the uh, winter garden or like spending time um, in climatic shields but supposed to do. Um, studies, studies, one of the studies I showed, they actually tried to, the Dutch study, they tried to show natural lighting conditions, they, they tried to reintroduce. And I do have uh, the follow-ups. I have uh, informal studies myself uh, from several nursing homes. A follow-up, like in Tisvar, outside of Haugesund, and in Ittere, outside of Levanger. They have, for over a decade, used uh, this combination of um, winter gardens with, um, with light, where they expose uh, the residents for this combination of light and uh, green plants. And I think it's no coincidence that these nursing homes are regarded like when um, four uh, health ministers in a row have gone through the country, they have visited uh, different nursing homes and they have said that these are the top. They see that everything is where it should be. So the long-term follow-up suggests that this combination of um, natural daylight and, um, and green plants and green fingers. Uh, it's a golden combination, at least. Yes? I have to tell you and everybody about Aaron Mattis, who's in Sarasota, Florida. He's developed a method called active isolated stretching, which involves stretching along every plane of mo motion. Um, for example, turn your head as far as you can and hold it Mm -hmm. for, for two seconds before the stretch receptors mm -hmm. click in through okay. every plane of motion. Mm -hmm. He stretches everything and it's fantastic mm -hmm. for Parkinson's. And I asked the question, how could stretching connective tissue affect neurochemistry? How could that be? And I found the answer. And the answer is the Merkel cells in the skin, which are stretch receptors, and so when you can move more, when you go from this to upright, when you move more, you stretch your skin more. It's not stretching the connective tissue, it's stretching the skin. And these Merkel cells are reporting to the brain and they secrete serotonin. And it changes brain chemistry, three or four sessions. And if the person doesn't go back into slump mode, they're okay. And if they start to slide, they can go back and get some more stretching. Mm. So I found that to be well really fascinating. That's basically what I've done in uh, North Trondlog in Levanger. That's so what you're doing. this seven-year study, where what we, the methods I use there is actually 
I introduce rhythm and I get people to to challenge uh, uh, the habitual patterns and go into all sorts of angles. So I've basically done the same thing. Great. And, and, and the thing is, they don't get cured by, from Parkinson, but they stay stable. They stay one, and stay and stay and stay. One last question. When we are talking about rhythms and rhythmicity, we're actually talking about the suprachiasmatic nuclei, which is the main conductor mm. for all our rhythms. Mm. Isn't it because of our mode of life today mm. is that we actually uh, destroy the function with the time of our suprachiasmatic nuclei? Not sleeping, not being in the dark enough, mm. or not uh, uh, facing Mm. The light dark cycles that we were born into it, mm. or evolutionary, mm. we were selected for it. Yeah. And, uh, many of the things that you are trying to cure actually uh, appear because of uh, damage we are causing to our super mm. Did you ever think yeah. of it? Uh, yes, all, only all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so uh, n no, but uh, uh, not specifically only the super super chiasmatic nuclei, but uh, this uh, what I'm thinking about all the time is this most most brutal law in life is use it or lose it. It's um, uh, even if you can look at muscle cells, what I uh, discovered is the simple fact that you have the uh, you have sprint, uh, let's call them the sprint cells and the long distance cells. And the most vulnerable are the sprint cells. And you stop running to catch the train. And if you do that long enough, if you never challenge them, you never use them, as you say, you speak about here, we can speak about many areas in the body, actually, where if you don't challenge them, then they just shut off and then they die. They say that bye-bye, cruel world. And, and then you have here. You have no... Uh, no way of getting them back. So I think we need to communicate this to the population at large. That small, simple um, exercises or corrections can uh, create longevity. I have a 30-year follow-up of 25-30 uh, years of a larger group of patients that I got when I started general practice after being a hospital doctor 30 years ago. And I see those uh, those who have done, I have a group who have done the Tibet, five Tibetan rites, have you heard about them? No. The five Tibetan rites, uh, just about uh, regularly, 10-15 minutes every day. And there you, you, you get many of these movements. Uh, and just doing that, uh, the results over time have been uh, uh, more than I dare to believe in. So it's, it doesn't have to be much, but we need to put in these small yeah, but here, when, when we listen to what the mechanism is, saying secreting more serotonin, this yeah. could be also secreting something that affects the brain and we are not aware of it today. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, we are in discovery process, but the main thing is that we need to, all these structures that we do have, they have a function, and this function has to be honored. If we, if we live a very one-sided life from a sensory of you, then uh, we don't know what the price is because we're doing an, an experiment now. In Norway, when I grew up, inactivity was not an option. If I was going to go anywhere, I had to run. Uh, and now inactivity is a serious option for the first time, and we're not seeing the consequences yet. So therefore, we need to be on the preventive side, definitely, and we know enough. As you say, uh, people are finding some of the same things. You're talking about this guy, he's doing. It, it, we are uncovering some basic mechanisms. And it's simple, it's not rocket science, that if you go like this, something happens that is different from when you go like this. It is. It's uh, intuitive. So, um, so I'm here uh, now, these, these hours, um, to be with you. And uh, so if you want to speak to me, I'm available today, tonight. And that's great. Yeah? Thank you, thank you very much. I think we, we have to stop here, unfortunately. Yeah, okay.